Thank you very much. Okay, so um, today I'm going to present joint work from uh, Formal Vindications, a company in the software verification uh, sector, and the University of Barcelona, which we were all affiliated to back then when Formal Vindications was a startup. So maybe you are wondering why you should be interested in a formalization of a UTC converter. And the honest answer is that probably you shouldn't. But I'm trying to tell a story here. So this is a story of a software verification project for industry. And the nice thing about this project is that it was our first one. It's uh, not trivial, but yet very simple. So it's nice to focus on the big picture on the design choices we had to make and the problems we had to face to, um, to work on uh, verification of software for industry and not for just academic purposes. So that's what I'm, I'm going to speak today. And just so you uh, know a bit uh, of the paradigm we use, our paradigm is um, we, we define all the software, both specification and implementation in the Cockproof Assistant and then we extract to use it uh, in OCaml or, or C. So, uh, a context of why we ended up doing this project. We work in the uh, legal sector, particularly the road transportation sector. So, in this sector, uh, basically, there are regulations in Europe, in the US, uh, that regulate the hours of service of the drivers, of the truck drivers. So how many, how much time they can drive, how much time they should be resting, and these kind of things. So here, uh, there are like data files, a data record from the, from the driver that a software must analyze following an algorithm that should be deduced from the regulation. That's an, another a whole story, but uh, let's not go into that. And then it must give an output with the violations that, did, that this driver committed. So uh, the times where he or she didn't comply with the regulation. Of course, this should be uh, a very uh, good uh, program because this is used as evidence in court. So that's why our uh, CEO thought about applying software verification for uh, for this, um, this uh, sector. Now, uh, doing, working in these algorithms, we discovered that actually time measurement is not as trivial as it may seem. So there are basically two kinds of standards for uh, time, time keeping purposes. On the one hand, we have the solar uh, standards that are based on the position of the sun. These are useful for astronomical purposes, but they are not practical for civil purposes because it's basically, so it's based on um, the duration of, of the rotations of, of the Earth, and this varies from day to day slightly. So a second in this paradigm is not always the same. Thus, uh, there's uh, another way of measuring time, which is much more uh, practical for this, uh, with atomic clocks. Atomic clocks can measure exactly uh, the same units of time uh, every time. So uh, this is um, nicer for computer systems and so on. But the issue is that if we want to use it for civil purposes, we still want to keep on track with solar time. So we want that uh, our clock says noon, more or less, when the sun is in noon, right? That's why uh, UTC is adjusted to keep track uh, with, with solar time, and to do this, there are leap seconds. So leap seconds are seconds added to, uh, the, to UTC to make it close to solar time. For example, um, in year 2016, there was a last extra second added to the year. This is decided by a committee of experts that see if a new second is needed. Theoretically, also, uh, a second could be removed, but this has never happened because the rotation of the Earth tends to slow, uh, to slow down and not to, to go faster. Um, since 1972, there have been a total of 27 leap seconds added. So this is not much, but 
it's, it can be important for some applications. So, uh, mostly, um, computers don't care about leap seconds, they ignore them. They just use Unix time. Unix time is a representation of UTC without the leap seconds. We just ignore them as, as if they never happen. And this is more or less okay in, in many applications because basically there are two ways of expressing time, right? The date time way, which we're used to, and then the timestamp way, which is more useful for computers and for time arithmetic operations. And basically a timestamp is the number of seconds elapsed since a given epoch, a chosen origin that we choose arbitrarily, like for example, year zero or year uh, 1970. So basically, if we um, ignore leap seconds as Unix time does, oh well, if we do it in both directions, then we really uh, won't notice. Uh, the only time we can notice is if we compute durations between two dates that had a leap second in the middle, but usually 27 second difference for many applications don't matter, so um, that's fine. The problem is that for some applications, it's actually important to, to count the exact uh, amount of time. And in our case, since we were in the legal sector and the law says UTC, we really had to comply with that. Uh, it, it can also, it's also used in, in some um, applications like uh, aerospace industry and so on. So basically, um, we really needed that, so we decided to um, start with a smaller project instead of the whole law. We just implement the UTC converter first. And our initial design, which was a bit naive in hindsight, uh, was just a specification, which should be very abstract and conceptual, explaining what these conversions are. And then the implementation, which should be an efficient algorithm, actually computing these uh, these conversions. Then we would have proofs in COG saying that they behave the same. And then we're happy, we can use the extraction mechanism to go to a camel in this case, and just use the code. That was our plan. So let's see how it went. First of all, uh, we defined our ontology, our uh, data types. Uh, for dates, we have a triple of natural numbers uh, for the year, the month, and the day. And then there's a notion of valid date that, for example, prevent, prevents us from writing things like the 32nd of January. And now the true date type is uh, a date together with a proof that it is valid. Then um, for time, we do exactly the same. Now we have a date and the three numbers. And the only different thing is that now valid time depends on the list of leap seconds. This list of leap seconds is parameterized in our, um, in our uh, project, so it can be updated as UTC is updated. Okay, now, so let's separate the date and the time, um, the time part uh, to understand it better. The definition of the spec, uh, as I said, a date stem of a date is the number of dates between the epoch and that date. So to define exactly this in COG, we just need a notion of the order on dates, which is just the lexicographic order on the triples of natural numbers. And then we also needed that the tape was finite and the type of dates was finite uh, because th this way we could use the fin type mathcom uh, type, which was uh, quite uh, useful because it has a nice theory. Uh, so we just set arbitrarily a maximum date, which is year 99.99 and then we have this definition of date stamp. Uh, given a date, we, we define it as the cardinality of the set of dates prior to that date. Uh, just mind you, the code, this code and, every, and all the code I will show is not literal. I prettified it. There are some dependent things going on here that I didn't show because I, as, as I said, I want to focus on the design choices and not so much on the code code. Uh, for time, everything, again, is exactly the same. The only difference is we depend on the list of leap seconds. Okay, so what about the inverse conversion? How do we define a function that goes from a date stamp to a date? So if we want to define it um, in, in the most intuitive way, what I would do if I really don't know how to compute dates and they give me a number, 
I take a calendar, a very big calendar from the start of all times, and I start counting. And if you give me N, I count N times. Where I end up, that's the date you were looking for. So that's exactly what we did as a specification. Uh, from date stamp takes the natural number and iterates N times the next date operation starting on the mean date. And the same thing for timestamps, as, um, as I said before, the only difference is that the next time the operation depends on the list of leap seconds to know if there's a, an extra second to count or not. Okay, that being said, what about the implementation? I'm not going to go into the details because I don't think there's, there are any universal learnings to learn about converting um, timestamps. But basically, uh, it's arithmetic, right? And you have to take into account leap years and leap seconds. And anyway, I just showed the code to the purpose of showing that these are actually operations and, and that's it. Uh, similar for timestamp. And what we are interested in are the correctness theorems. Um, so basically, our correctness theorems say that the implementation of, times of uh, this function timestamp behaves the same as the specification, so they are extensionally equal. And similarly for the inverse conversion. Mind you, the inputs have to be valid in some sense, so the time has to be valid, and the timestamp has to be in range. Okay, so first problem that we found. We wanted just to extract this implementation and be happy, but this was not possible. So the first problem was the extraction of the type NAT. Of course, so NAT in COC is a unary type, as you, I guess you know, so there's a zero constructor and a successor constructor, and that's it. Of course, we didn't want to extract that because, well, but what we wanted to do was to uh, map it to the OCaml in type, which is a, tree, a common trick. The issue was that, of course, this is not verified, and there's a complete, uh, complete lack of control of possible overflow. Uh, basically, NAT is unbounded while OCaml's int is bounded. So we really needed to know if we were overflowing at some intermediate step of our uh, process. We had the strong intuition that we didn't because our maximum date was uh, small in comparison with the maximum int, but there was no, uh, f no formal proof of this. So that was the first uh, big issue. Thus, we, defined, we decided to add some other step to our design. Our new step was a, a new implementation, but this time a data, it, it would be rather data refined. So this is a refinement. We use the same algorithm, but this time with efficient data types. And we prove it equivalent to the, to the other one. We extract, and maybe this time we will be happy. OK, so how does this work? Our refinement uh, was from type NAT to the type of unsigned integers, primitive unsigned integers in, in COC. Uh, there, we, we, we also needed the, the signed integers for some of the operations, and actually signed integers didn't exist at that point in, in COC as primitive. So uh, one of our colleagues teamed up with the, with the COC developers and the, uh, it was a contribution for, uh, for COC. Okay, so how do we do this? Basically, um, there's, uh, we define a function from uint to nat, and then we have to write mostly a, a library converting from the operations uh, from one to the other. For example, for addition, we need to prove that for any uint uh, numbers that satisfy certain, um, certain bound conditions, the addition performed in NAT gives the same result as the addition performed in uint. So we wrote these kind of lemmas for every of the operations, at least the, the ones we were interested in, and we package everything as an independent library that can be installed through OPAM. So if anyone needs this kind of refinement, this, this can be used. Um, now, now that we have this library, what do we do with it? Basically, every time we had a function that went from types in, on NAT to types on NAT, now we, we need a function that goes from types on uint to types on uint, and then we prove a lemma that if the input is valid in some sense, is bounded in, in, a, in a correct way, then 
uh, one function behaves the same as the other. Okay, uh, to do this in our library, there were some hellish uh, things in the middle because we had to prove that all the intermediate steps wouldn't overflow, right? And since there's so much um, tricky arithmetic going on with years, leap years, leap seconds, and so on, we ended up with really um, ugly inequalities that are true, but they are true for boring reasons. So at least we didn't find an, a beautiful mathematical pen and paper proof that this holds, but it actually holds. So you can prove it case with many cases and so on, but that, that was really tedious, so we uh, chose uh, automating tools. In our case, uh, we just created a tactic because there, there was no suitable tool at that point with primitive integers, so we created a tactic that just brute force computed every case. And it, got, it, it, it is pretty quick, it works for one, two or three variables in unsigned or signed primitive integers. So this is also packed independently. You can use it if, if you want. Okay, that being done, we found a second uh, problem in our design. Basically, we found chaos in the extracted code. We hoped that the extracted code would be quite nice, but it wasn't. It was extremely long, like 40 megabytes of code. And as a consequence, uh, it had long compilation time. I said 10 minutes, but I don't really remember. Maybe it was more. And uh, there were many, many object magic operations. Object magic is a function in OCaml that casts any type to any type. And it's needed because of um, the difference between cock types and OCaml types. But it was really concerning that our uh, goal was so full of it, full of it. So why was this happening? Because we were using uh, many dependent types and we were heavily relying on MathComp that uses uh, so many structures in COG that are not representable in OCaml, so the conversion was, um, was really a mess. So what did we do to solve this? We just add an extra step. Uh, in this step, we write uh, the implementation again, but this time it is a clean version. So we don't use any dependent types or things that are not representable in, in OCaml. Now I'll explain a bit more what, what this means, but you may wonder why uh, the three steps of implementation instead of uh, doing everything uh, one at, at once. And the answer may be, well, because we just found the errors in this order, but actually um, it would have been Mm, I think impossible to go from the spec directly to the to the endpoint because the last part uh, uses types and um, structures that really don't have a strong uh, theory in, in code that don't have strong lemmas. So in this way, we can really use the libraries that that there are already uh, in code. It's, it ma makes the proofs much easier, not not harder. Now, uh, what do, what do I mean by this clean version? So we rewrite the code only the code meant for execution, of course, uh, and this time we do it avoiding dependent types. Thus, we avoid the libraries that, that rely on dependent types, we rewrite the, the functions that come from those libraries, um, and we prove the equivalence of this new code to the original code. This may seem a lot, but it, they are, of course, trivial proofs, because we are rewriting exactly the same, just forgetting some of the parts that we are not interested in. Um, for example, uh, we were using the in function in MathCom that uh, is a predicate for an element to be or not in, in a list. And we just rewrite it uh, without using the EQ type structure that is needed for, for the use of this, of this function. And in this way, the extraction is, is quite clean and the lemma proving that they are equivalent is just a, a one-liner. Now, this has the pros that you get clean OCaml code that is almost equal to the, to the original code code, so you can check as a human that the extraction is doing things that make sense, and there are no object magic in the result. Um, the cons are that this is, of course, more work and more code to maintain, but it, it was, uh, the payoff was good for us. Yet we found another problem, that is that we didn't have error control. So, 
our lemma say if the inputs are valid, then the result is correct. But in the resulting code, wrong inputs were accepted without any warning. And, of, and then, the, as a consequence, unexpected out, outputs were issued. We tried to um, explain to our client that all was fine because the lemmas were correct, but he was not satisfied with this uh, answer, so we had to do something about this. So what we did, no extra steps. We, at, at the last step, we already incorporate the error control. And the way to do it, uh, in our case, was just like an option type, but uh, with more informative none. So instead of none, we said no because the date was invalid or no because whatever, right? So there are several uh, possible errors. And then we have to prove things about the error handling. Like um, if you give timestamp a valid time, then it will give you a result that is the same as the specification result. And if you give timestamp an invalid time, then it will give you an error invalid time. And then we can even uh, write wrapper code already in OCaml, not in, in Coq, um, to, to convert this kind of error handling to OCaml's error handling with exceptions, with nice error messages for the user, and then the client is happy. Okay, so in summary, uh, what we had was uh, FB time, a verified UTC library as a result, but in the middle we also got um, a refinement library from uint to nat and from uh, the signed integers to the integers in mathcom. Then the tactics for brute force computation, a method or a methodology uh, for extracting clean code with this error control and a general design for um, software verification using the, the extraction mechanism. I hope uh, it was enjoyable. Now I will answer questions if you want. Thank you. Questions, please. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, so we have a lot of time for questions. <laughs> Oh, this is Adam Chapalo from MIT. There's a trade-off with having native support for particular integer types in Calk, which is that the trusted kernel of the proof assistant gets larger, and it's more likely there would be bugs hiding there. My understanding is the reason for doing that is all about efficient computation inside of Calk. Did your project take advantage of that efficient computation, or might it work as well with uh, these integers defined from first principles? Uh, we actually took advantage of it, so... Uh well, on the one hand, many of the proofs were, were done using these tactics that, uh, that use brute force computation, so with other types uh, that wouldn't be possible. But also, even without those tactics, many, there were always many side conditions and many of them just, uh, just were gone because of this computation possibility. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Dmitry Tritel, University of Copenhagen. Um, since you introduced the error handling only at the last layer, I'm, uh, the actual error messages are not verified, right? Uh, so you could give a wrong, your verified program could give a wrong error message. Not really. Well, so let me show you. So the error control is in this last step, but uh, the lemmas about it uh, cover cover everything, right? So they, you really prove that if the input was valid, then your result will correspond to the specification result, and if the input is invalid, you will give an invalid uh, message. The only part that you can um, screw up is the wrapper, but I mean, it's just going from uh, an invalid time constructor to a nice message say, saying it is an invalid time. So then it's not a refinement proof, but an additional property that you prove of the clean version. Yeah, the, the part of error control, I wouldn't say, is, is a refinement, yeah. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I love hearing talks like this about, like, that sort of start with, like, well, you'd think this was simple, right? But, <laughs> um, so I feel kind of bad asking this, but uh, 1752... How are you handling the problems uh, with the computation of the date for 1752? 
1752. Um, it was the change between the Gregorian and the Julian calendar. <laughs> so the year, the year is down 10 days. There wasn't a third of September that year. Okay. Uh, yeah, we just implement the Gregorian calendar as if it um, existed uh, from year zero. That, okay, that, yeah. that makes sense. So in which case, I'm going to feel even worse about the follow-up question, which is, <laughs> are you planning on handling internationalization and things like the Ethiopian calendar being a few years off, um, time uh, zones and this kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> no is a valid answer. Yes, uh, I think my answer is no. <laughs> That's probably the smart thing to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm Siddharth Gadgil from Indian Institute of Science. I had maybe a naive question, but now we have Lean 4, which is both a programming language as well as it just runs. <laughs> so if one was to do this today, do you think it would be more efficient just to write the code in Lean and run it? Uh, you don't have this issue of generating OCaml? I'm not sure because I'm no, not knowledgeable in Lean, but I think that today the the, the, um, uh, the chose the uh, sorry the choosing process would probably favor Lean a lot more than than that day. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. I'm Fafonia. Uh, I'm the assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I have a question. Like um, in your error message, there's a number out of bound. I wonder what it is used for because you already have an invalid date, invalid hour, invalid anything, everything. Mm. Uh, so what is the number of out of bounds for? Is Let me think. I, it was for a very specific possible. Ah, yeah. Okay, because I didn't talk about it, but we so the library doesn't do only the conversion between UTC and timestamps. The, it also uh, does time arithmetic. So, for example, you can add um, 100 years to whatever date you have. So, number out of bounds was when you were giving a too large duration to add. So, something like this. Ah, I see. Thank you. Oh, and, and this... I have a comment, it's that I'm looking forward to anyone trying to formalize time zone, which I think <laughs> will be very exciting. And thank you for your talk. <laughs> Hello, René Thiemann from University of Innsbruck. Uh, I was wondering, you have this upper fixed maximal year bound, like 9,999 or something. So uh, would your method which uh, just enumerates all the numbers, right, you had this tactic for the range check, does that scale if you would add, say, a few zeros to your maximal year? Uh, would that be a problem then, doing brute force? Uh, no, it, won't be a pro it wouldn't be a problem because our maximum, so the range in which we use that tactic, sorry, uh, yeah, here, this number has to do with, I think, uh, 400 years, which is an era, which is the, um, how we pack years to compute things, because every 400 years, the leap years are regular. So uh, it, we don't need to use the tactic for all the range of dates. So it wouldn't matter. It, it, I, it's, if we are below the overflowing part of OCaml, then we are, we are fine with, with this technique. OK, thank you. Lars Peters, Aarhus University. Uh, in, in industry, people often want to have FIPS certification or common criteria or something like that. Did you get that request? How did you handle it? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the so, question. Sorry, can you... So, so in, in industry, they usually have different standards for quality. Yes. Like common criteria or something like that. Imposed by what? Imposed by government. In, imposed by government. And formalization should help in getting these quality stamps, but we usually don't get them. <laughs> Is this something you have experience with? So, uh, mostly on the regulation and legal part, we have tried with the European Union to establish some, some criteria, but it's, at least in this sector, it's very difficult because uh, you talk to lawmakers and they don't know what you're talking about, basically. So. <laughs> But, but as a community, would, we should explain to them. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, help is welcome. <laughs> I have a question. So, the leap second is going to be abandoned in 2035, right? So yes, that's arguable because uh, they are always discussing this, and I'm I'm not sure this is a final decision. But yes, uh, they cause so many trouble that they are thinking about abandoning it. Anyway, there are 27 leap seconds added that <laughs> we really need to account for. So Also, there is something, uh, the, the, the GPS satellites, they're using the GPS time, which doesn't have leap seconds. Uh, does, yeah. it, does it relate to that somehow? Can it does, do it does because uh, in our field, so the truck drivers have this machine, this device in their truck, and it receives a GPS signal, and it is not in UTC, it is in GPS time, so that's another conversion that we will need to deal with at some point. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? All right, let's thank the presenter.